In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your uh, priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in order that we might become the pivot that may, uh, as an influence, restore this country. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. 1821. Then Peter came to him and said, it's always Peter with the big mouth and all the questions. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? As many as seven times. Now, Peter thought he was doing something great by saying this because in the Mosaic Law, the requirement was three times. Of course, you were also commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. And that goes along with forgiveness all the time. Uh, But uh, Peter took a special interest in the Mosaic Law and had a tendency toward legalism. And therefore, he thought if he did it seven times, the Mosaic Law only says three times, well, he's doing something great. And then the Lord says, Jesus said to him, Not seven times, I tell you, but seventy times seven times. We calculated that as 490, but that number means nothing. It simply means an infinite amount of times is the amount of times we should forgive fellow believers, no matter how obnoxious. And so what we did uh, on Thursday was reverse the situation. And I told you how many of you have wanted to be forgiven, all of us. How many times have we wanted to be forgiven? Every time we screwed up, of course, because we all have obnoxious traits and we all want to be forgiven when those obnoxious traits arise. So if you reverse the situation, you know yourself that you always want to be forgiven no matter what you've done. And so the Lord does forgive an infinite number of times. Therefore, in Colossians, it tells us to forgive as the Lord forgave, and that means infinitely. If someone does you wrong, don't uh, get a chip on your shoulder and run around all mad. Forgive and keep moving. That's the only way you're going to live your spiritual life. If you get a chip on your shoulder and think you're always right and therefore you're going to be bitter the rest of your life, well, eat that bitter pill of arsenic and you'll die miserably. So every time you have a trait that is obnoxious and it comes out, you obviously want forgiveness. However, how many times do we give forgiveness to others who are obnoxious toward us? Not very, not as often as we would like to have forgiveness. Therefore, our Lord comes up with the parable of the implacable slave in 1823. Matthew 18:23. For this reason, and this is our Lord beginning a parable. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. The king represents our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, and he wants to settle accounts with us. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, the account is settled. And all of us have debt. All of us are sinners, and we have accrued debt. And a lot of times you accrue even more debt by trying to be good to get into heaven. And you want to work your way into heaven, and every time you try to work your way into heaven, you're accruing debt, not relieving it. So the kingdom of heaven is like a king, Jesus Christ, who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. 1824, as he began settling his accounts, a man who owed $10 million was brought to him. This is the equivalency of what might be in your Bible. It's approximately $10 million. Now, of course, there's been a lot of inflation, so it might even be more than that uh, by this date. Uh, These notes are probably... Uh, some of these notes and some of the the $10 million figure was made in 1965, so it's uh, adjusted for inflation. What would that be today? Astronomical, $100 million maybe. So because he, was not, because he was not able to repay, the Lord ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, children, and all he possessed, and repayment to be made. 
the Lord here is referring to that king. And because he could not repay the $10 million debt, the whole family was to be sold and put into slavery. That's analogous to the slavery of the old sin nature, the slavery of not being a believer. 1826, Then the slave threw himself to the ground prostrate before him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will repay you everything. 1827, the Lord, that is the king, had compassion on that slave and released him and forgave him the debt. Remember, this is approximately $10 million worth of debt. 1828, after he went out, the same slave, the one who had been released of the $10 million debt, the same slave found one of his fellow slaves who owed him $20. Then he grabbed him by the throat and started to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So there's a picture out of this parable. Point one, the picture is of the Lord forgiving us $10 million. Actually, an astronomical figure. Whatever figure's in your head, that's how much we've been forgiven. Trillions, actually, but this is just a parable so that we can understand. Point one, the picture is of the Lord forgiving us ten million dollars. Point two, even though they have been forgiven a ten million dollar debt, they now try to run out and shake twenty bucks out of a fellow believer. They've just been forgiven uh, ten million dollars. Our Lord's trying to make it dramatic. It's as if you had a ten million dollar debt with the bank, and the bank says, nah, forget it. And then you run out uh, toward your friend who owes you 20 bucks and choke the person to death to wring out 20 bucks from his wallet. 1829, then his fellow slave threw himself down and begged him, Be patient with me and I will repay you. 1830, but he refused. Instead, he went out and threw him in prison until he repaid the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were very upset and went and told their Lord everything that had happened. Then his Lord called the first slave and said to him, Evil slave. This is analogous to carnal believer. Carnal believers do not offer forgiveness. In fact, carnal believers are extremely hypersensitive toward self and they expect all the forgiveness in the world, but when it comes to others, they're insensitive and they give no forgiveness. This is a part of legalism rearing its ugly head and lashing out. And you're a loser and you'll die a loser. And God will smite you. Forgiveness is part of the spiritual life. Our Lord forgave us everything. We must forgive others. No matter what the things they've done to us, no matter how harsh, no matter how much we were offended, forgive, forget, move on, grow up spiritually. Get your eyes off people and your eyes on the Lord. That's the concept. Always running around worried about people? Well, you'll die and have no eternal rewards and you'll go to heaven and uh, you'll be glad you're there. But he refused. Instead, he went out and threw himself and threw him in prison until he repaid the debt. And then the Lord found out about it and said, Evil slave, analogous to carnal believer, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. 1833. Should you not have shown mercy to your fellow slave, analogous to fellow believer? We're all slaves, by the way. And there are some passages that say the wife is the slave of the husband. And we are the slave of Jesus Christ. It's not a demeaning thing. Do we ever bulk? Do we ever get a stiff neck and say, Oh, the Lord thinks I'm his slave. And then, But when you tell a woman you're the slave of your husband, they bow the neck. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, yes, you are, whether you think so or not. Because we've studied from Genesis that uh, your desire... It's an insatiable desire. Your insatiable desire shall be for your husband. And that doesn't mean a sexual desire. It means you have a desire to override your husband's authority. You want to wear the pants, yet God designed it in marriage that the man wear the pants. And Scripture backs me up on this. I wouldn't make it up. If it were the other way around, I would gladly follow it, but it's not. 
It's the man in authority, period. And in this case, we're all slaves of Jesus Christ. So he says, evil slave, carnal, carnal believer, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have shown mercy to your fellow slave just as I showed it to you? The Lord Jesus Christ has showed us a tremendous amount of mercy. And if we go around not forgiving fellow believers, but instead living under the concept of bitterness and constantly gossiping, maligning, and judging, and constantly ripping each other apart because you've felt harmed in some way, you have uh, insensitivity toward others, hypersensitivity toward self, and you've lost in the spiritual life. And our Lord sees this in the, in the disciples. And remember, the disciples make it, so there's hope for all of us. And right now, the disciples earlier, remember, had been arguing amongst themselves. Who's the greatest? I'm greater than you are because you're a so-and-so. And then the other person got offended. No, I'm greater than you are because I saw what you did last week. And then they got at each other's throats. And so the Lord has to put a stop to it and say, Look, I've forgiven all of you $10 million. You're strangling each other for 20 bucks. It's time to forgive. Time to move on in your spiritual life. 18.34, And in anger, his Lord turned him over to the prison guards to torture him until he repaid all he owed. A perfect picture of divine discipline for the carnal believer. It's torture. You don't want it. First of all, you torture yourself in bitterness. You're bitter because you were offended. You're bitter because of something uh, that uh, someone has said about you or perceived to have said about you. So you are embittered. The Lord tortures people like that. They torture themselves, and then they're tortured by divine discipline. So, evil slave, carnal believer, you receive the anger, as it were. That's an anthropopathism. The Lord has never been anger ever, ever. And this isn't really an anthropopathism because this is dealing with a parable and the Lord is a human king. And human kings always would express anger at something like this. Just as David expressed anger when Nathan came up and said, uh, this man stole a sheep and then uh, killed the man. And then David said, well, he must be executed and pay back fourfold. And it turned out they were talking about David and that was his punishment. 1835. So also my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you does not forgive. Now this is from the frontal lobe in the Greek. And it's what you think. And you could uh, verbalize forgiveness, but if you don't think it, it's worthless. You could go up to say, and say to somebody, I forgive you, and it's in the past. And then uh, you still, in your frontal lobe, you're still mad, you're still upset, and you're still ripping them apart, still going to gossip and malign them. And it's, so it's what you think, and that's the issue. This forgiveness is from the frontal lobe, the mind. You forgive them in your mind. So also my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you does not forgive in your mind your fellow believer. So if you harbor bitterness toward someone else, vindictiveness, revenge motivation, revenge modus operandi, if the only thing you want to do is destroy someone else because you were offended by them or insulted by them, then you are described in 1835 as someone under divine discipline and someone in which the heavenly Father... We just had a prayer meeting and we go into prayer humbly because it's our direct link to God. How many of you would rather right now be on a cell phone than listening to me? Do you know that when you go into prayer, it's as if you're picking up your cell phone and have a direct link to God? The Almighty God? Think about it. Think about how much time you spend on a cell phone rather than in prayer to the Almighty God. And that's our privilege. Now, I'm not being legalistic in saying you should pray uh, all day, all day long because you have the right. I'm just telling you, maybe uh, in our frontal lobes, somebody needs to come first. Instead of somebody on your cell phone, maybe God the Father. And so, you go into prayer, a direct link to God. And right here it says, My Heavenly Father, this is the Son of God speaking, and He's saying, Look, if you harbor these mental attitude sins and if you refuse to forgive, my Heavenly Father, God the Father, will do to you. He's making an analogy. What will He do? He'll torture you all the days of your life. God makes war against the arrogant believer, but He gives grace to the humble believer. 
Do you want to make war with God the Father? Go ahead. You'll lose. Now we move on to Matthew 19, verse 1. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. Now we get into the subject of divorce again. We studied divorce in detail, so I won't go over it in detail again, but there are some remaining principles. Now what we have here is uh, the fact that some scribes and some Pharisees, actually these are Pharisees, and they come up to the Lord with four phony facades. Actually, this is four phony facades. And it's not, the subject really isn't divorce. The subject is about these legalists trying to get at the Lord. And they could care less what the Lord thinks about divorce. They're trying to trap him, even though he's the one who created the law. He created it in eternity past. Now they're going to question him on it, and they're going to be sorry they did, because uh, our Lord's a bit too smart with the debater's technique to even... He's so far above them. You know what I saw on TV, or not on TV, on the Internet... Uh, Judge Roberts being interviewed, he's the one up for the Chief uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, and he was being interviewed by uh, most of them, Democrats, a few Republicans even, joining in on the criticism. And they thought they were so, they were so pompous. And those Democrats, with their limited vocabulary, and many of, the, many of them couldn't even speak, we used to have one in this state called Fritz Hollins, an insane man. The guy, never mind. But he's out now. Good. But uh, all these Democrats are were trying to ridicule this man. And he just very calmly ripped them to shreds. They didn't even know it. He was running circles around them, and they didn't even know it. They were so full of themselves, they thought they were making good points. And then uh, he would use vocabulary. They were lost, and it was obvious. And he's going to pass, by the way, because uh, he pretty much humiliated them without even raising his voice once. And I imagine this is how our Lord is dealing with them. Remember before he had been brazen. He's changing now because they'd already rejected him. And now he's just going to simply, uh, uh, well, he's going to show his smarts and their stupidity. And they'll be, uh, actually they'll get angrier at this than when he was tough on them. And that's because they're going to be humiliated. So we have divorce and the four phony facades. Verses 1 through 9, we have exposure of the facade of the Pharisees. They're not really interested in what our Lord has to say. They're just interested in ripping Him apart and discrediting Him. And He, he, he runs circles around them. They don't even know what hits them. Now in verses 1 through 2, we have the credit card of the Messiah. That means, you see, our Lord was able to perform miracles from the filling of God the Holy Spirit, that was his credit card to flash around, or we might say his ID. When a police officer comes up to your car and uh, you want to know if he's a police officer, he'll flash his ID. Well, this uh, is like a credit card or an ID for the Messiah. The reason why he could claim he's the Messiah is because he's going around healing people. And he doesn't even bop them on the head. And uh, that's his. he says, look, I'm the Messiah. It's the first time this has happened. So he shows the... The ID. So 19.1, Now when Jesus finished these sayings, he left Galilee and went down to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan River. 19.2, Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. The purpose of healing is, of course, as we've studied, the focus on the attention of our Lord's message. It was to focus them on the message. And, the, and what would happen was they would say, Well, this man can heal like this. I better listen to what this man has to say. And that, is, that was the focus of all of it. Then in 19.3, Then some Pharisees came to him, testing him. They asked, is, that, is the criterion for divorce anything? In other words, can people get divorced for any reason? Is the criterion for divorce anything? And this is a loaded question. Because if our Lord answers that... Uh, you should not divorce uh, for any reason of simple incompatibility or dissatisfaction, then the Pharisee, or actually, if our Lord says, look, if you're dissatisfied in marriage, get a divorce. And they've got him there because they would say, oh, you treat, uh, you, you abuse the law because the law does allow for divorce. And if our Lord would have said, hey, you can get divorced for anything, Moses said you could, then they would say, you abuse the law. 
But if on the other hand, he took the strict view and says, no, nobody should ever get divorced, then they would say, you ignore the law because of Deuteronomy chapter 24. And that is where the, the Pharisees are getting this from. They're basing their whole argument on Deuteronomy 24, but our Lord's about to throw a big wrench in their argument because he simply does not accept their premise. The best way to win an argument is to not accept the premise. If someone says uh, there's global warming because of uh, people cut down trees, and then if you say, well, no, there are more trees now than ever before, you've accepted the premise that if you cut down trees, there'll be global warming. And it's not true. Cut down all the trees you want. It's still, you still won't have global warming. But if you come at them like this and say, well, there's really more trees now, you've just accepted the premise. And there's a way, a debater's technique, in which you don't even have to accept the premise. And if you don't accept the premise, you can throw a wrench in their argument uh, by using some other premise. Now, we'll see a little later that our Lord actually accepts the premise of someone that's completely wrong. They say salvation is by works. So he accepts the premise, and then by accepting the premise, later he comes back and hammers them down. There's two different ways of debate, all of which you'll learn in college if you ever go, maybe even in high school if you take public speaking or something else. I doubt it. Probably you get these things in college. So the Pharisees came testing him, and they asked, Is the criterion for divorce anything? It's a loaded question. And their loaded question is built around Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. What did they do in 24, 1 through 4? Well, it, uh, we'll get to it and we'll quote the, the passage, but I, I need to tell you something about the loaded questions. If you ever get a call from a pollster and they want your answer to come out a certain way, they'll load the question. For example, they'll say... Uh, since New Orleans was hit by a hurricane and there was mass disorder following the disaster, would you say that George W. Bush is a good president or a bad president? Well, the first part of the question is loaded. If you come out and say, oh, George W. Bush is a good president, you look like an idiot because they've just based the whole premise on the fact that uh, New Orleans is wiped out and had disorder because he's a bad president. No, New Orleans was wiped out and had disorder for many reasons. And the president can't be held fully responsible. There are state and local governments and all of that. But it would be a loaded question on an interview. Or they would say, uh, since George Bush lowered taxes on rich people who don't need their taxes lowered, was that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, they're already directing you in the area in which they want you to answer. And so don't believe these polls if you ever read them. I doubt you do. Don't waste your time. And that, so we move to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. So turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. This is actually the basis in which the Pharisees try to build up their argument. And they know 24, 1 through 4, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, very well. When a man has married a wife, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. This can be vice versa, of course, but always the Bible approach, approaches this from the man's viewpoint, probably because the man is the authority. When a man has married a wife, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her. Now, this uncleanness does not mean to be physically dirty. It doesn't mean she forgets to bath, bathe, and therefore he divorces her. It's a technical word uh, defined by the Mosaic Law. And most of the definitions come out of the book of Leviticus, which talks about uncleanness. I won't give you all those verses. It would be useless. So, this uncleanness does not... Uh, well, it runs all the way from uh, touching a corpse to adultery. In the Old Testament, if you touched a corpse, you were considered unclean, ceremonially unclean. But if you committed adultery, you're morally unclean. So there were literally hundreds and hundreds of ways in which a person could become unclean. And they are divided into two categories. First of all, we have ceremonial uncleanness. Ceremonial uncleanness. 
Secondly, we have moral uncleanness. Now, in Deuteronomy uh, 21.4, the uncleanness for divorce is moral uncleanness. But through the ages, the Israelites, many times through their history, distorted it. And they would say, you know, Deuteronomy 24, 1-4 says, if, uh, if my wife is unclean, I can divorce her. So the wife would, uh, for example, he would set her up. If he wanted a divorce from the wife, he would simply set her up and say, uh, go to so-and-so's house and uh, pick up some sugar or something. So they would go to so-and-so's house and in the house would be a corpse. She entered the house where there was a corpse. She is ceremonially unclean. And so while she is going into the house, he's running off to the priest to get a certificate of divorce. And he'll say, my wife's unclean. She just went into a house where there's a corpse. That's ceremonial uncleanness, and that was a distortion of the law. That's not a reason for di divorce. Now, you could get divorced for any reason then and now. The cultures of, of Israel and our own culture are pretty much the same and we have almost the same laws, and etc., except for the ceremonial laws. But this was dealing with moral laws and moral uncleanness. But uh, it came to pass that if you were dissatisfied for any reason, you could hop out of a marriage. Same today, same as it was back then. And it's always a sign that the country is in degeneracy, just as Israel was. This, of course, was designed for the moral reason. If the woman committed adultery, the man is not only free to divorce, but he's free to remarry. And that's not the only reason. There are many reasons given. So the divorce rate in Israel often became very great due to the misinterpretation of the Mosaic Law. There was also a great deal of uh, build-up of arrogance, and very few people possessed true humility, so divorce became prevalent. If one's always right and the other one's always right and they're both at each other's necks, of course it's going to be hard to get along. That's why in marriage, that forgiveness passage I told you about is extremely important. 19.4. See, they're focusing on, go back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. And the Pharisees, they're focusing on the... Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. They're focusing on that passage. And what our Lord does is doesn't even accept that premise and skips all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And that's the true precedent. 19, 4. He answered, Have you not read? Oh, that had to insult them a little bit because the Pharisees read all the time. They've memorized portions, if not all, the Torah. And so our Lord looks at them and says, Have you not read? Well, that just, it burns them up. That from the beginning the Creator made them male and female. So Jesus simply doesn't accept their premise of Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. And as a result, it makes it impossible for them to trap our Lord. They can't trap Him now because He's not even using that verse as the basis. You see, our Lord's about to take the strict view of marriage. That, of course, uh, divorce was something that was never intended but had to come to pass, and he took the strict view. And so the Pharisees would have pounced on him for it. But instead he relies on a different passage that takes the strict view, therefore they can't attack him. It's in the Bible. So he goes straight to the garden. Now we must take some principles down concerning marriage. Point one, marriage is a divine institution. It's divine institution number two. And it's intended, intended to be permanent. When God had Adam and Eve, when God created Adam and Eve, that marriage was intended to be permanent. And in fact, it was till they died. Adam loved his wife very much. And his wife actually took control of the marriage. And I know this because of Cain and Abel. Their family was dysfunctional. Eve took over. She took over from the beginning, remember? She forced him, or didn't force him. She asked him to eat the fruit, and he did. And they had a dysfunctional family ever since. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel. And uh, if you have a marriage in which there is a, a revolt on the part of the wife, it causes the children to have... Uh, well, it's dysfunctional, and they too may revolt against authority. 
Now, it doesn't mean if you have a wonderful marriage that your children will always turn out wonderful. There's always the concept of a bad apple, and uh, they just make the choice, no matter how great a family they can come from, to be bad. So if you see a terrible child, it might not always be the parent's fault, and that shouldn't be a point of judging anyone anyway. So marriage is a divine institution and intended to be permanent. Point two. There are legitimate reasons for divorce, and always in the Bible, divorce means right of remarriage. When you see divorce, it means along with divorce comes the right of remarriage. Now, in our culture, we say divorce if you just, uh, after a year of separation and you get a divorce, you're divorced. But if it's not legitimate... According to the Bible, it's not really a divorce. It might be a separation. And there are certain cases where separation is completely necessary, such as if the husband batters the wife. And if the husband batters the wife and the wife leaves, as she should, and she goes on her own way, that's fine. It's, it's biblical and she's not sinning for doing so. But if she goes and marries another man, she would be sinning. She would be committing adultery. But in the case of uh, marital unfaithfulness, if the husband goes out and commits adultery, the wife has every right to get a divorce and remarriage. And divorce in the Bible always comes with the right of remarriage. That is legitimate divorce. Point three. There are legitimate reasons for separation. Yes, yeah, some people stick it out. Some people separate. And there are legitimate reasons for separation. There are legitimate reasons for breaking up a home. But remember, when you separate, you're breaking up a home, especially where children are involved. And therefore, the two people go and live apart, and neither of them have the right of remarriage in this case. And there are three different categories. There's, uh, there's the first category, people stick it out. They might be miserable in the marriage, and uh, but they stick it out and rely on the divine solutions. Or, number two, they get a divorce. And a divorce in this case, I'm talking about legitimate, biblical divorce, in which one has the right of remarriage, at least on one part of the party. And the part that receives the right of remarriage in the case of adultery is the one who's innocent. If the one who is innocent did not commit adultery then the, uh, they have a right to divorce and remarry. The other person doesn't. Then we have point three, and that's secular divorce. And that is a divorce a court grants, but it's outside of biblical principles. And the courts today will grant a divorce for just about anything, incompatibility. And they did the same in Israel under this uh, concept of the Mosaic Law. But in that case, if you just uh, have a secular divorce and go to the court and you're divorced, according to the Bible, no right of remarriage is allowed. So secular divorce is permitted. doesn't mean if you get a divorce you're sinning. It's permitted. It means if you get remarried and your divorce wasn't legitimate, then you've committed adultery one time, and then that marriage has been completely dissolved. And so you rebound and keep moving. If you've been involved in that, there's always the grace of God. And some of us don't uh, know all the biblical principles and we get divorced here and there and then uh, get remarried and don't even think about it. Uh, but uh, that one time of the uh, adultery, as it's called, if you marry someone else before uh, without a legitimate right, that first uh, night would be adulterous. Then after that, the marriage, the first marriage is dissolved Therefore, you rebound and keep moving. There's no way that the marriage could continue in adultery. It just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be part of grace. It just wouldn't, uh, sometimes those marriages do even make it if they both grow in grace. So it's a one-time thing. And there, there, there is a legitimate, legitimate reason to just uh, get a divorce and without the right of remarriage. There are many legitimate reasons and all of which aren't even listed in the Bible, some of which are common sense. For example, a movie I watched, and the guy and the wife lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania, my birthplace, and the man owned a pizza shop. Now, he went out and he committed adultery many, many times. 
and he was a type of uh, live wire type guy and just uh, always on the move. He, he never hardly would sleep and was just uh, full of energy. And he was out uh, delivering pizzas and also uh, delivering uh, adultery. And his wife found out about it. Now, instead of having a legitimate divorce, she became so angry, she decided that she would kill him, both with the influence, of course, of the mother-in-law. And the mother-in-law happened to live there, and there's a whole different set of principles that come out of that. And uh, so what happened is the, the mother-in-law influenced her daughter to kill the husband. And so... First of all, she made spaghetti. They were Italian and they loved pasta. And she made a big bowl of spaghetti. And then they dumped a buttload of pain pills in the spaghetti and mixed it up. And uh, the man ate it. And But it had no effect on him. And he was run he said, let's play Monopoly. <laughs> and they all went out into the living room, into the kitchen and played Monopoly. And then he got hungry and said, uh, give me more of that spaghetti. <laughs> And he was eating it like crazy. No one else would touch it. And he was just uh, unstoppable. And everybody else was trying to fall asleep, and he's wanting to play board games. Well, finally he goes to sleep and passes out in the bed from a stomach ache, of course. And then uh, she says, well, let's kill him. And so they bring in some dope heads. It's really a good movie. I don't remember the name of it. Love you to death. I would. It's an older movie, but in the 80s, I believe. But I would recommend it. It's funny because they get these dope addicts to go in the house and shoot the man. Well, they're so doped out of their head, and they're trying to figure out which side's the heart on, and they the heart is on, and they put uh, their hand over this side, and then their hand over that side, trying to figure out which side, and then they don't figure it out, and so they just close their eyes and shoot. And I think they missed. And then finally, uh, either the mother-in-law or the daughter, I can't remember which, I think it's the daughter, goes up and uh, gets enough nerve to shoot him. No, they accidentally hit him in the head, didn't they? Well, they shot him in the head, and, uh, and then the wife feels very sad about it. So she goes downstairs, and she's Catholic, and she starts praying to the uh, idol of Jesus Christ she has there. And she's begging for forgiveness. And while she's begging for forgiveness, this man walks down the stairs and says, Honey, I have a headache. Get me some aspirin or something. Mm -hmm. A true story, by the way. All of it's based on a true story. But the point is, in the end, let's take the divorce out of it. Uh, or let's take the adultery out of it. Because in the end, uh, they get, go to court for murder and all that, or attempted murder, because he lives. But he decides to stay with the woman says the woman made him change his mind about his lifestyle. It's a hilarious movie. You should watch it. But the point is, in that case, let's say the man had never committed adultery. The point is, if uh, some woman's crazy shooting you, throwing pots and pans at you, you have a legitimate right to divorce the nut. You have a legitimate right to go away from her. But you do not have the right of remarriage. And in this case, if he had not committed adultery... He was free to go then anyway. But if he had not committed adultery and she was acting like that, uh, he should leave her and should have left her. And it would not be sin. And the reason I bring this up is because so many people get on their high horse concerning divorce. And some people say, I'll never divorce that. I'll never marry that person because that person had a previous divorce. And sometimes the pastor has had a divorce before and they say, oh, the Bible says he must be married to one wife and he's had three divorces. They're so stupid, they don't even... He still, if he's married, he's still married to one wife. That means no polygamy. It means uh, he can't be married to three women and run a church. How could you? You're running a, an insane asylum with three women, especially if they're all pregnant at the same time. You know pregnant women. You get three of them pregnant at the same time and you're married to them. Muslims are under a lot of punishment, I'll tell you, because those Islams, they uh, marry all these people and think it's wonderful. They're crazy. And so, of course, you're not going to be a pastor with three wives. You won't have time to study. And then, uh, but it means uh, be married to one wife at a time. And sometimes pastors have had legitimate divorces. Sometimes the woman has ran around on him. What's he supposed to do? Just sit there and take it? 
No, not as a pastor especially. He's supposed to show some backbone. And any pastor would sit back and simply take that. He's the one who shouldn't be a pastor. If the man said, look, you whore, I'm getting a divorce from you. And he doesn't even have to say that with any type of a bitterness. It's just a fact. I'll get a divorce from you now. Go on and sleep with however many men you want to. I'm getting a divorce. And then the whole church goes, ooh, we've got to get rid of that guy. He's had a divorce. There are legitimate reasons for it. And let's say she didn't even commit adultery, but she's beating him every night with pots and pans and trying to shoot him. This happens. He has a right to divorce and vice versa, of course. But along with that does not come the right of remarriage. So don't get legalistic about uh, this divorce thing. And our, our Lord knew that he was being trapped, and he knows everything regarding this. Now in 19.5 he says this, and quotes from the Old Testament, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with his wife, and the two will be one flesh. The most interesting thing about this verse is the fact that in Genesis, when our Lord gave Adam and Eve this verse, they didn't have a father and mother. They hadn't even fallen yet. They hadn't even ate of the fruit. They didn't even have a concept of family. And so he's saying to them, having no mother and father, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will be one flesh. He says it in anticipation, and so that our eyes will be open to the fact that uh, mother-in-laws do not have any say in a marriage. Mother-in-laws have no say in the marriage. Oftentimes, mother-in-laws like to get involved in uh, the, uh, for example, uh, they'll want to control the wedding and control who the pastor will be and control how this will be and how that will be. I watched a movie the other day. You probably think all I do is watch movies. It's, it's just the few ones I watch, I remember them. And it dealt with a mother-in-law who was very forceful. Monster-in-law is the name of the movie. And Jane Fonda plays it. Don't like her personally, but she's a good actress. And she played in this, and she was a real kook, nut. And she's trying to run everything. And instead of the man, the man should have had enough spinal cord to stand up and say, Look, this isn't your marriage. I'm getting married. You deal with it. You go to hell. Get away. Well, he wouldn't say that. Of course, it's his mother. But he could say, uh, You stay out of it. Otherwise, I'll have to separate from you because one of the highest causes, the highest reason for divorce is mother-in-laws. It's true. It's documented. And this is why the Lord brings it out so early. Leave father and mother and be united with wife. doesn't mean you, have, you can move across the street and leave father and mother. It's, called, it's a, really a mental separation, a dividing line where uh, you've had your marriage and the authority lines of your marriage. Your husband should have been the authority, probably wasn't. That's why you're trying to run everybody's life. But uh, you had your marriage, now they're going to have theirs. And whether they live next door a thousand miles away isn't the issue. The issue is mental separation in terms of the authority boundaries. The mother-in-law must recognize that her husband is now the authority and must stop trying to bully around her daughter, etc. He's the authority now. She isn't. And this confusion of boundaries causes much pain in marriage. 19.6, that's just an aside, no extra charge. 19.6, so, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. So then, what God has joined together, no one is to separate. Our Lord is taking the strict concept of marriage. And that's because our Lord designed marriage, the second divine institution, and it was designed to be permanent. So why is there divorce? Well, our Lord gives the answer. Jesus said to them, Moses, and this is funny because our Lord gave the law to Moses, and he's having to explain the law he created to a bunch of people who think they know everything. It's really a hysterical type situation. Jesus said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hardened. This means they had negative volition. They had a stiff neck toward the Word of God. Their hearts became hardened. 
But from the beginning, it was not this way. And it wasn't. There was no sin nature in the beginning. No way Adam and Eve could harden their hearts until they ate of the fruit. So from the beginning, it was not this way. And from the beginning, Adam and Eve were designed to be permanently married. 19.9 Now I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now he's not saying this is the only exception. He, sa he uses this one exception because it comes out of Deuteronomy and he uses this one exception because the Pharisees will know this one exception and also he uses this exception uh, because a lot of the Pharisees got divorced uh, just because they were unsatisfied in marriage and uh, thought it was just completely all right and then go ahead and get remarried and so our Lord steps on their toes and says look uh, except for sexual immorality, you get uh, remarried, you've committed adultery. And believe me, uh, a lot of those people would never ever be caught being called an adulterer. Oh, they thought about it in their heads, of course, and our Lord already rebuked them for that. But they always follow the law, and they would never commit adultery, never even, uh, well, they would think about it, but nobody would ever know. And so the, all the time these people are being trapped they thought they would trap the Lord, and He just uh, turns it right around on them. 19.10 The disciples said to Him, this is after the Pharisees had departed, If this is the case of a husband with a wife, it is better not to marry. Well, what happened was uh, the disciples heard this uh, for the first time. They had always taken the Pharisees' view that divorce was for any reason. And then when they find out that uh, if you get divorced for any reason and get remarried, you've committed adultery, well, that just took them aback. They'd never heard of it that way before. And so they all got together and started discussing amongst themselves and said, you know what, it'd be better not to even get married with this, this such a strict view of it. And this, by the way, was a, was a thought that the Apostle Paul had in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It was, it was a thought from the Holy Spirit. But what our Lord is about to do here is give three different categories of celibacy, and uh, which for some people, they have the gift of celibacy. Most of us do not have the gift of celibacy. If everyone had the gift of celibacy, there would be no continuation of the human race. But our Lord did give the gift of celibacy to a few people because of their special status in life, such as the Apostle Paul. And what the disciples had to say is probably one of the smartest things they've said in a long time. Well, if this is the case of a husband and a wife, it's better not to even marry. Well, according to the Apostle Paul, it's true. So he said to them, Not everyone can accept this word except those to whom it has been given. That means except to those who have been given the gift of celibacy. Some people, like the Apostle Paul, were given the gift of celibacy. Therefore, they, had, uh, they knew it. They knew why they, the Apostle Paul knew why he had it. He had to concentrate on the word of God. He didn't have time for the normal things we have time for in life, such as marriage and family. He would have been studying all the time and the wife would have been neglected. So God says, all right, you have the gift of celibacy. You are not designed to be married. Doesn't mean he didn't have normal sexual desire toward women. Doesn't mean that at all. He still did. And, but don't feel sorry for the Apostle Paul. He had something greater than marriage. He had a double portion of love from God the Father and toward God the Father. That's where all his love was spent. Then in 19.12, For there are some eunuchs. These are people who are born with no libido. A eunuch. Doesn't mean they don't have genitalia. It means they have no libido. And they're born that way. It, it doesn't, don't confuse this with impotence. Impotence comes later in life, sometimes from physiological things and sometimes because of mental reasons. But you don't confuse this with impotence. A, a, a person who is a, a eunuch who were that way from birth are people like Richard Simmons, a eunuch from birth. 
No, I, I, I always thought he was... I know. I always thought he was... I always thought he was homosexual. But my mom got a book on him and read up on him and he claims he has no sexual desire either way. And he's not homosexual and he doesn't even care for women either. There are some people born eunuchs with no desire. The Apostle Paul was not a eunuch. Richard Simmons may be, but the Apostle Paul isn't. And he's a funny looking character and we shouldn't laugh about him. He had, a eunuchs have the same right to grow in grace and in knowledge as everyone else. So for there are some eunuchs, no libido, who were that way from birth. And some who were made eunuchs. That was from castration. And back in that day, if the king wanted a lot of male servants, and he didn't want them to mess with all of his wives, he would castrate them. And so they would not uh, have any sexual desire for all his women. And they, these are people made eunuchs by others. And some who became eunuchs. This would be like the Apostle Paul. They chose celibacy. The Apostle Paul chose celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who is able to accept this should accept it. And the only people able to accept this are people with the gift of celibacy. Everyone else has the, as the Apostle Paul calls it, fire, passion, lust. And he had it too, but uh, he could control it. We can't, so we have marriage. And in the next hour, we'll move to Jesus and little children. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we have noted so that they can become a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.